Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and today we will be looking at eight soul-riveting stories of fresh golems to cannibalistic pigs from Clive Barker's Book of Bloods. English playwright, author, and filmmaker Clive Barker has made a name for himself in the horror genre after having contributed to it significantly since the 1980s. After writing many stage plays, Barker finally shifted to writing books, his most prominent work being the six-part anthology fiction, Books of Blood. Each volume contains four or five horror stories that have been adapted into films and in television several times, including the most recent adaptation on Hulu in 2020. With its infamous tagline, Everybody is a Book of Blood, wherever we're opened, we're read, Books of Blood has gained Barker more fame than any of his previous works. After a fraud psychic is paid a visit by real ghosts and spirits one night, turning him into a real medium between the living and the dead, he begins writing his stories on his flesh. Their stories made him a literal book of blood, and the readers get to read each of these stories over six different volumes of the book. The first three volumes are titled The Books of Blood, the fourth volume, The Inhuman, the fifth as In the Flesh, and the final and sixth volume is titled Today, we will dive into eight different stories from all the volumes of the books and explore them in great detail. Before we go into today's analysis, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small step for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, on with the video. Number 1. In the Hills, the Cities, Volume 1. Set amidst the tense political climate of the Soviets in the 1980s, in the hills, the cities, follows the journey of a gay couple, Mick and Judd, as they travel through Western Europe and figure out their relationship, the broader scheme of things, and the collapsing world around them, as the line between fiction and reality gets blurry. Judd and Mick travel through Yugoslavia, during a time when two cities, Popolak and Potohoveo, are conducting a ritualistic celebration that occurs every 10 years. But little do they know that this year, it's all about to go haywire. While driving, the two think about how much they really dislike each other. While Mick is irritated with Judd's inevitable habit of politicizing every aspect of life and lecturing without end on topics that Mick thinks are boring, Judd thinks about how uninterested Mick is in all things that one should really pay attention to. Judd thinks of Mick as someone too idealistic and carefree in a world that is clearly going through some big changes that need to be acknowledged. Finally, the two get into a spat, and although Judd seems insistent on arguing, Mick tries his best to give him the satisfaction of the same. The two decide to put a temporary stop to their fighting by making love in a spontaneous moment after Mick makes Judd get out of the car in the middle of nowhere. Meanwhile, the contest between Popolak and Potohaveo takes place, and the people in both the towns tie themselves to each other in form of two giants. The town that is able to create the more majestic giant usually wins the competition, but something goes horribly wrong. Some of the people trip, causing the Potohaveo giant to collapse entirely, which ultimately results in all 38,765 citizens dying. A gruesome death. When the Popolak giant saunters in as the tall skyscraper that it has built itself to be, it sees the large number of dead bodies, all wound up and tied together. It is enough to drive the citizens of Popolak insane. Having lost their sanity in a bizarre turn of events, the citizens of Popolak develop a collective conscience and disregard their individuality. This causes them to literally turn into one big giant and act like one mind that walks around aimlessly, till the citizens start dropping dead one after the other from the lack of food and dehydration. But despite the loss of so many people, the Popolak giant continues to walk. When Mick and Judd come across the massacre that happened to the Potohoveo giant, a local explains to them what really happened. But the extraordinary nature of the catastrophe makes it difficult for the young men to believe in it. The local man attempts to steal their car so that he can chase after the Popolak giant and perhaps save the remaining citizens from dying painful and horrific deaths. Meanwhile, Mick and Jug find shelter with an elderly couple. While there, the Popolak giant arrives 
and as more people continue to die, the frail giant topples over the shelter and ends up killing Judd by accident. Devastated by his lover's death, and shocked to see that the local man was indeed telling the truth, Mick is unable to comprehend the trauma. This causes him, as well as the elderly people that took shelter with them, to go insane. The story ends with Mick climbing atop the Popolak giant and merging with the collective conscience as he is carried away atop the hills. The concept of Barker's story is unique and is often seen in comparison to the broad line of work on the widely celebrated mangaka Junito. This is because Ito is known for its deeply disturbing imagery, this imagery he uses to portray the twisted reality of our world, as Barker has done in the hills, the cities. The idea of individuality being lost screams at us to draw more attention to the importance of individual identity and how it is imperative for people in a society to not lose it. It is easy for us to become part of the norm, and that has been happening everywhere in the world as a part of the larger scheme such as politics, as well as the smaller schemes such as household traditions. Not many are able to question the norm, the authority to stand up to it, and this story is a bizarre yet horrifying exaggeration of the implications that it can have on us. Or rather, already has on us. Number 2. Skins of the Fathers, Volume 2 The story starts with a man named Davidson, whose car breaks down somewhere in the middle of the Arizona desert, following which he gets out to look for somebody who can help him. On hearing some music that makes him think there's a carnival going on, Davidson follows the sound and finds himself close to a parade of people marching through the desert. However, to his horror, he discovers that what he had assumed to be large hats were not so, and the people were actually much taller than average humans. Seeing this nightmarish group of giant monsters, David is terrified and begins to run away when he sees that one of them charging towards him. However, the monster destroys Davidson's car before it catches on fire. Instead of attacking Davidson, like he thought it would. This monster, like others of its kind, had only one eye and has mouths on its hands. After having disfigured some bit of its face, trying to stop David's car from exploding, the monster stumbles straight into the town of Welcome and collapses. When panic ensues, one of the mouths of the monster's hands ends up attacking the sheriff, in response to which a woman named Eleanor shoots and kills the monster. In the same town, a family of three is languished in pain, living a life of abuse. The father, Eugene, cannot stand his son Aaron and his wife Lucy, so he beats them up regularly after getting drunk. But the history of the family is more closely linked to that of the giants and have arrived in town sooner than we think. In the backstory, it is revealed that in the beginning, there were only women that lived in peace and harmony and that these women had created men as their playthings. They, however, are quick to recognize their mistakes, as it is that these men, who go on to dominate them, abuse them, and even treat them like slaves. These men are those giants who were parading through the Arizona desert, and any man born afterwards was because of the woman's efforts to correct their mistake and create men that were better human beings. Six years prior to David arriving in Arizona, Lucy was raped by one of these monsters in the desert, leading to her conceiving Aaron. This explains the lack of connection Eugene feels towards his son when the monsters arrive. Aaron runs towards them and calls them Papa. Sadly, Eugene kills Aaron when she sees that he is beginning to transform into a monster. This, along with the town having formed a posse to fight the monsters, enrages them. Using some inexplicable power that they have, the monsters turn the whole desert town into quicksand, and just when the people have sunk below the surface, the ground solidifies killing them, and leaving the ones still stuck halfway in anguish. David and Eleanor are the only ones that are left stuck halfway above the surface, along with a strange man who happened to fall in head first into the quicksand. This left his eyes buried in the ground, but his nose and mouth still breathing. Although Lucy survives, she knows that there is no way that she can help, and so she simply runs away, leaving the three to be cooked alive when the desert sun comes up. The story of Barker seems almost like an attempt to rewrite the Genesis with the gender roles reversed, but with just as much violence. He tries to shift the focus from women being created by men to men being created by women, which has actually been appreciated by several feminist critics. It has had its own set of backlash for the reason that it still advocates for violence against one gender 
and inequality, rather than aiming for a utopia that will see both genders in equal respect. Number 3. Human Remains, Volume 3 This story revolves around the emotions, or rather lack thereof, of Gavin, a gay prostitute who ends up getting hired by an archaeologist. As the night progresses, and the two men indulge in the company of one another, Gavin finds himself at some point in need of using the bathroom. On entering, he makes a strange discovery. In the archaeologist's bath lay a statue of a man that almost resembles a human figure. Not giving it much thought, Gavin almost forgets about it. But in the weeks that follow, he finds himself being haunted by someone who looks just like him. The more he is haunted by this doppelganger, the more he can sense that his mind and body are transforming over time. He becomes less emotional, and his actions look more lifeless. His eyes look like they have nothing to see anymore, and eventually he turns into a living dead, not requiring any of the things that humans do, such as emotional stimulation, physical stimulation, or even food or sleep. One night, he walks to his father's grave while he is on the verge of losing the last bit of remaining humanity with him. It is here that we see that same statue once again, except this time, he knows who it is. The doppelganger that has been haunting him. Despite knowing that he is now worse than a dead man, Gavin sheds only a few tears, but it still feels unmoved. So much so, that even the statue seems like it is more lively than Gavin, and with this realization having dawned on him, Gavin accepts his fate, and allows his doppelganger statue to go on, and live the life that he cannot anymore. Although this story seems quite bizarre, and even difficult to make sense of eventually, it is clear that once you pay attention, that Gavin's story is an exaggeration of how most sex workers really live their lives. They go about their work without deriving any pleasure out of it, and train their minds to never get attached to anyone or anything. To most of their clients, the lack of emotions and apparent humanity makes them more appealing. So, when the archaeologist first meets Gavin, we can assume he was already in the process of becoming lifeless, and with each client he served, Gavin more closely became a zombie. But he is finally able to rest in peace, where he is sure that the statue will take on his persona and solidify his youth and beauty forever. Number 4. Down Satan, Volume 4. The story is one of Clive Barker's shortest, and has quite an ambiguous ending but that's perhaps what makes it one of the best. Down Satan tells the story of a man named Gregorius, who has seemed to be struggling with his faith, till he arrives at a point that has left him both helpless and depressed. Having become tired of waiting for a sign from God, Gregorius decides to create his own hell right there on earth, which he would use to lure Satan for himself. He believes that once Satan's evil clutches are all around him, God will for sure appear before Gregorius in order to save him and his faith and devotion. Things as expected go awry once the large cathedral dedicated to Satan is finally completed by Gregorius. Having lost track of what his initial intentions were, Gregorius is now beginning to enjoy being in the presence of evil. He tortures and executes many people in chambers that were specifically designed, and the story is left with an open ending, leaving readers wondering if Satan did truly take over Gregorius, or if the man's mental illness simply drove him insane. Either way, the story confirms for the protagonist that neither God nor Satan is real, and that faith alone cannot save those he chooses as his next victims of torture. Seeing how Barker himself is gay and might have struggled with his homosexual identity, it cannot be overlooked that he must have struggled with his own faith and belief in God at some point. The story reflects that dilemma, although it is much more dramatized fashion than in reality. Many people find themselves questioning the existence of God, especially in the face of danger and atrocity, and find it difficult to keep their faith intact when they see God allowing so many bad things to happen in the world. This story leans more on the side of the dystopia, where the struggle of faith does not end in it being restored. Rather, it is confirmed that neither God nor the devil will be there to interfere in our mortal world, if at all they exist. Stephen King, revered as the true king of the horror genre, courtesy his mind-bending and supernatural themed books like Carrie and the Shining has deeply praised Barker's works and states, I have seen the future of horror and its name is Clive Barker. Number 5. Hell's Event The story begins with the most atrocious revelations. Apparently, Hell came up to the streets of London and brought with it the icy bitterness that even the blistering Indian summer could not be able to cover up. 
There is clearly a purpose for this arrival, and we learn that a sporting event is about to commence. It has been going on for thousands of years, and the participants of Hell have always been competitive in this event. A race is about to take place, and the warm-up commentary has already begun. It is being called a charity event, where the proceeds would go to a cancer research program, but it is clearly about something else. We are introduced to some athletes, Joel, Kinderman, Lawyer, Voigt, and the others. Frank Flash McLeod has earned a reputation of being one of the fastest in the circuit. Joel was an Olympic gold winner, and he was a courageous runner who believed in his skills and his good luck charm. While the race was in progress, we were witness to something strange, when Cameron follows a car into the building. Upon entering the place, there seems to be something strangely off about the place, engulfing in a goat-like odor. It is bitterly cold inside, and we learn that it is actually a bit of hell on earth. One of the racers falls off the track, and some hands seem to grab him from under the surface, unseen to the others. McLeod was leading with Joel in pursuit, but he was lagging behind. While this was unfolding on the tracks, a terrifying truth is revealed. Gregory Burgess, a member of the parliament, serves Hell, and in return, Hell serves him back. He is doing the bidding for them to win the race against Heaven, and if they win, humanity will be doomed. Such races take place once every hundred years, and the outcome determines the fate of the world. Cameron witnesses the grotesque creatures from Hell, and desperately tries to make it to the tracks and tell the world about the impending horror. One of the runners was running for Hell, and treachery ensured that he would win. McLeod collapsed towards the end, and Joel moved ahead. McLeod egged him to finish the race without looking back at all, and it seems something good inside him had been stirred. Joel realizes the actual stakes of the race, and as the others fall, he keeps up his speed. One of Hell's runners bites his face off, but the struggle ensures that a human runner finishes the race, causing Hell to lose one more time. Gregory is brutally punished for his failure to make Hell win, and humanity is saved. This amusing story is a rather comical allegory on politics, and using sports to stir up the fun is an innovative idea. Is there a slight hint here about democracy being a lot messier than what it seems to be? It could be well implied, but the major part of it, the elements of the horror, is less prominent in this story than in some of his other works. In short, the narrative is open to any two forms of opposing politics, and it is intentionally made comical and goofy. London, being a place of hell uprising, and a race between heaven and hell, is certainly quite unique, but we have to say that this story does not hold up to the high standards set by Clive Barker and his other horrifying works. Number 6. How Spoilers Bleed Locke is the cold-blooded leader of a group of European mercenaries. The story opens as he inspects the forests of South America. He seems to be in awe of the diversity of beastly things and beautiful ones in the forests, but he is not there to appreciate nature. His thoughts are disturbed by one of his colleagues, who seems quite worried about the fate of one of their co-workers. He has some strange disease that they cannot make sense of, and his skin falls apart by a mere touch. His colleague is worried that they might have caught the disease from the native tribal people, but he is confused because they did not touch any of them. But Locke firmly dismisses the possibility that it is some curse. The narrative begins in present tense, and when we are drawn into the past to get an idea of what exactly happened there, they arrived at this place and thought it was deserted, until they saw traces of the tribal people. They were expressionless, and Locke could not understand their intentions. They were not being violent towards them, but their gaze wasn't exactly friendly either. These tribal people clearly did not seem eager to move away from the place under any circumstances. It was their sacred land, and they simply did not understand the concept that their homeland was now being owned by other people. Locke and his men have made it clear that the natives would have to move out, but they continued to stare back at them and their expressionless faces. One of the tribal folk could speak English, and Locke conveyed that they would have to vacate the land. They did not seem to listen, and enraged, one of the men accidentally shoots a little boy dead. It was not intentional, but there would be a price to pay. A senior member of the tribe puts a curse on them, and it causes a terrible condition. Their bodies become so brittle that even a strong breeze could do some serious damage. A mere touch could wound them, and slowly, one by one, the men start dying. With time, Locke realizes that it was nothing but the ancient curse, and only the tribe could now fix it. 
However, when he returned to the same place to beg for forgiveness, a horrible sight awaited him. It seemed like one of his colleagues had killed them all, and now there was no way to fix things. Even Locke seems to be affected by the curse, and the story ends with his sense of helplessness and doom. We loved the attention to the details of this story, and the comic version took it to another level entirely with its vivid sketches. It is quite a bloody and gory story, so if you are averse to such elements, you might choose to give this a miss. The elements of the tribal folks used in the story were pretty cool as well, and their cold and unbashed mannerisms were quite creepy at times. A backstory about them would have been nice, but we could tell that they were really one with the forest. It could have been a bit longer, with some more explanations, and the characters could have been more than the horrible douchebags that they were. Overall, it is an intriguing Clive Barker story, and you will find it quite an enjoyable read. Number 7. Pig Blood Blues The premise of this story is a correctional home for children. However, this place is not home to petty thieves or small crime convicts. Only those with a history of serious violent offenses are sent here. We are introduced to an apparently strict facility where the children must remain under strict discipline. Redman, a disgraced cop, finds himself in charge of the facility, and he had no illusions about the inmates there. There weren't the usual misunderstood, misguided young minds, but those who kept razors under their tongue and simply wanted to be out to continue their evil ways. A lady welcomes Redman to the facility and tells him how some of the boys are a bit too aggressive. They find it extremely hard to control themselves and it becomes a big problem to manage them. As they speak, a nasty fight breaks out and Redman moves in to handle the defeated fellow. The young boy named Lacey is bashed up and he needs immediate medical attention. However, the very next day, Redman finds out that something is amiss about the young fellow. He talks about some pig and desperately wants to get out of there, completely paranoid. Before he is whisked away, Lacey says something about Hennessy being back. We learn that Hennessy had disappeared mysteriously a while ago, and there was some connection between Lacey and him. Redmond did find things a little bit fishy, but he would soon become too involved with the case. The inmates treated Redmond with respect, even if they did not like him. They knew he wasn't somebody to be messed with, and they behaved accordingly. Redman, however, could not get the case out of his mind, and went to explore a sty nearby. He came across a strangely hypnotizing pig that seemed to stare him down before moving back inside. Redman interrogates Lacey to gain some more information regarding the case, and he is shocked at what he reveals. Hennessy had planned it all meticulously to live forever. He hanged himself and made sure that his spirit would live within the pig forever. His spirit now possessed a large sow in the facility's farm project and kept haunting the place. Initially, Redmond did not believe a word, but slowly he came to realize that Lacey wasn't lying after all. He finds out that the faculty and some of the other boys are trying to feed Lacey to the giant pig, and the foul play is pretty obvious. The investigations don't really lead to a happy ending for Redmond, as Lacey is eventually possessed by the spirit of the pig that eats him alive. This is certainly not one of the easiest stories to explain, simply because of the outrageous elements used in the narrative. We regard this story as one of the hidden gems of Clive Barker, and while the plot may sound a bit ridiculous, the graphic novel will give you the chills. It is more of a mystery horror story, and the shocking twists were really unexpected. The level of violence is just about the right amount, and it is only during the climax that things really get ugly. Redman is quite a heroic character, and the tragic end will leave you shocked. The catastrophic ending is fascinating, and we can promise you that this is a story that will get to you. Number 8. Scapegoat A boat ride turns nasty for a group of four friends, Ray, Frankie, Jonathan, and Angela, mess up the navigation, and they end up washing up on the shores of a strange island in the middle of nowhere. Everyone seems to blame Jonathan for his mistakes that caused the vessel to be misguided, and he assures to the others that the oncoming tide would sort out their problems. The boat that is stuck would be able to roll out onto the sea, and they simply have to wait for the time being. The group starts exploring the island, and given that the island is rather small, there's not much that they can do. There seems to be no signs of life, and the rocky terrain is entirely made up of giant boulders. Suddenly, Angela makes a startling discovery. She finds three sheep in a crudely made corral, 
and their presence is in the middle of nowhere, making it very mysterious. They are in terrible shape and it seems quite natural because there is nothing to feed them. Angela and the others head back towards the vessel and leave Jonathan with the sheep. On the way back, Frankie hears a sudden cry of the sheep and runs back. She is shocked to find her friend holding a bloody rock and beating one of the sheep to death mercilessly. There is a sense of savagery in the way that the animal is slaughtered, and Frankie's entire face is sprayed with sheep blood. She tries to convince the maniacal friend to return to the boat immediately. When Frankie returns to the boat, we have some more shocking news to follow. The island, it seems, is more than what it appears to be. It has existed since the days of both the world wars. All the bodies of the dead soldiers who died due to drowning in the vessels washed up on shore, and with time, boulders formed a burial ground for all the dead souls. It is a tainted maritime cemetery, and their presence is certainly not welcome. Frankie tries to find Jonathan, but now the island seems to have a life of its own. Pieces of rock and dirt seem to shoot into the air, and one of these smashes into Jonathan's head. Frankie is in shock, and the raining rocks make it impossible for her to flee. As she stands motionless, she watches an elderly sheep feeder in his rowboat. He gestures for Frankie to come to his boat, and she follows the instructions. We learn this man is in charge of providing the island with sheep as sacrifices, and the dead acknowledge the gesture. Frankie watches helplessly as their boat is crushed, and Angela is probably dead from the shower of rocks. Ray is lost at sea, and it looks like Frankie will be the only survivor. Or will she? If there is anything constant about Clive Barker's stories, it is the uncertainty. Suddenly, there is scraping of fingernails under the boat. The old man is drowned when the vessel capsizes, and Frankie realizes that the rotting hands have grabbed her by the ankles. She drowns as well, and like all the others, even her spirit is now bound to the island for an eternity of suffering. The sense of doom in this story hits hard, and the unpredictability will keep you on the edge of your seat. Until the end, you will expect Frankie to survive, but clearly, fate has something else in store for her. The violence is disturbing and quite graphic at times, and this one is not for the faint-hearted. The helplessness makes things all the more disturbing, and you know from the beginning that there is nowhere to run. If you are in for a tragic, blood-curling narrative that doesn't care about its protagonists at all, this one would be a fun read. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to send a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. For Marvelous Videos, I'm Rylan. Have a good one and be safe.